Hello, I'm Bruce Kidd with the Kidd Consulting Group. This is our next installment of Insights for Executives video series. Um, my experience with business owners for the past 30 years is that there are two things they think about on a daily basis, the opportunity for growth and the risk associated with building a company. Sometimes risks they can control and sometimes risks they can't control. What we've all experienced for the last two years is that lack of control environment of the pandemic. Uh, it's had a wide reaching effect on all of us personally and professionally in our businesses. And so the opportunity and risk profiles have changed for a lot of companies. And what I'd like to talk about today is a little different than some of our previous videos. I wanna talk about the opportunity to prepare better for the risk side of the equation while you continue to try and grow the opportunity side, the growth side of your company. So I've got a special guest today, a friend of mine, Terry Ford from Greg Green Appel. Terry, thanks for being here. Thanks, Bruce, for having me. Um, tell the audience sort of what you do. I, I know what you do because you work with closely held businesses and entrepreneurs and companies of all sizes every day. Mm -hmm. and, and your job for them, what you take very seriously is what? What do you do for them? Yeah, so what I do for every one of my clients is essentially I'm an extended branch of their risk management team. Either they have it or I am their sole risk manager. Um, really, what I try to do is dig in and uncover what your personal exposures are within an organization and how best I can protect your risk. So um, at the end of the day, it's your personal assets, whether it's yours or your company's assets that are on the line. And my job is to protect those to the best of my ability, sell you to an insurance carrier, and make sure that that insurance carrier is buying in and essentially uh, covering your exposure. Yeah, and, and you do a great job. Thank I, you. I've been with you with many companies, and uh, I like your approach. Uh, I like um, that your focus is helping them build a sustainable, profitable, successful business by making sure they cover some of the things that maybe they haven't thought about from, from a risk standpoint. Sure. They, they know the logical, easy to identify risk profile things, but there are other things that you help them with, which I think is terrific. So the word that comes to mind uh, for me in today's environment, both, both for us at home and in our businesses certainly, um, is uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You know, there's just a lot of uncertainty in the world right now uh, with the pandemic. And, and it's, it's not gone away for sure. And it certainly impacted your industry and mm -hmm. the companies you're trying to serve, their opportunity to carry that risk, you know, to cover that risk. Sure. Um, so I've got an example here uh, of, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but let, bear with me. Um, so I went to the grocery store the other day and I bought a, ba a pre-made bag of salad. Mm -hmm. You know, you open it up, you put it on a plate and you're ready to go. And um, it was noticeable when I got home, A, that the bag was smaller, mm -hmm. B, there was less salad in the bag, and C, I had paid a dollar more. Because I'm not nerdy about keeping track of prices, but I just, I will use enough of that that I just remembered sort of what the price was. And so me as a consumer, I'm getting less product for more, and I get it. But it, it's a direct outcome of this pandemic for these consumer product companies trying to adjust mm -hmm. what they're providing us. In your world, working with company owners, a lot of times it's sort of just an automatic renewal. You know, I just I know what my coverage is for my company, and let's just renew and keep going. But the last two years, that world's changed, has it not? For for the people that provide the insurance and for you that's representing those companies and what options you can bring to the table for them. Um, back to my bag of salad. If they don't pay attention, aren't they getting less for more? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think you touch on and you use the salad example, but really, you know, I look at it from the market perspective of two things. You're either in a soft market or you're in a hard market. And somewhere in between, I guess, could be the third, if there's a third. Um, soft market tends to lull you to sleep. Yeah. You know, you, you got a salad bag that's full of salad and you're paying a certain price. And in a soft market, maybe due to competition, you can lower that overall price. Well, pre-pandemic, we were trending towards a hard market. Uh, insurance carriers weren't making any money off of the books of business that they had. 
And so for them to understand how insurance works is the premiums that an insurance carrier charges a business, um, that's not really how they make their money. They make their money off of investing those insurance premiums in the marketplace. And when losses exceed that investment that they're, that they're incurring in the marketplace, when they far exceed that, they've got to reset their books. And that's what triggers a hard market. And that's yeah. what insurance carriers were doing. They were trending towards a hard market, trying to reset their books to make them profitable again. And that was pre-pandemic. That was pre-pandemic, yeah. correct. Okay. And so then the pandemic hits, right? And you talk about uncertainty earlier. Well, it just made it worse because now transactions that used to take place in the insurance world between a broker like myself and the end buyer or, you know, or the consumer, um, where we might sit across the table from one another, dig into policy language, et cetera. Well, those days pretty much van or vanquished right then and there, vanished right then and there. And so you isolated everybody, made the industry a little bit more uncertain, and it was a great time for carriers to take advantage, for lack of better terms, the end user buyer. Yeah. Uh, the reason being is because now we're in a hard market. Pricing was already going uh, up. Um, now we have the ability to isolate and reset our books even more. And that restriction or constriction in the marketplace then allowed for uh, terms and conditions that used to be readily available. Uh, now all of a sudden we see sublimiting of values. We see uh, potential carriers getting out of the marketplace. Yeah. And as a result of that, um, that isolation forced the insurance buying process to become way more transactional. Yeah. That transactional piece has continued to a, a, a further extent since the pandemic. Um, a lot of buyers today are traditionally thinking, well, I don't have to be involved. I'm going to get the same product for the same price. But as you just alluded to in the marketplace, uh, that's just not the case anymore. Right. Um, that trend of restricting coverage and paying a high price is still there today. And as a result of that, unless you have a broker that you're working with that um, is intuitively looking for those things and arguing that on behalf of your organization, you may not know what you're getting. That, that really is what hits me uh, because, again, of the pandemic and the uncertainty and just the way we had to change the way we run businesses. Mm -hmm. So many new things to get our arms around as far as what's changed, how do I manage that. No offense, but I'm guessing the insurance piece of that for a lot of people got pushed down the list because mm -hmm. they got fundamental things like all my workers are gone. Right. Um, how do I track new ones how in? Do, how do I get new people? Mm -hmm. All the wages are going up. H how do I continue to make a profit? Insurance is really important. You know that better than anybody. But day-to-day um, -day operations, I got to focus on that until I get my arms around how to run my business in this new world we're in. Is it fair to say that a lot of them just haven't paid attention the last couple of years? Th those owners and CFOs, uh, not not that they haven't paid attention to the to the insurance, but what they're actually getting. Back to the bag of salad, what I'm actually getting. If they are they digging in enough? I I don't know. I think the savvy insurance buyer is. Okay. I think the more sophisticated that CFO or that CEO that really looks at it more than just a line item on their uh, profit and right. loss statement. Right. Um, I think that those individuals certainly are. Yeah. Um, and we all, regardless of the size of the organization that we operate in, we all should should be a more sophisticated buyer. I mean, yeah. don't you want to know what it is that you're really putting into your mouth on that bag of salad, yeah. so to speak? I, I mean, know. you yeah. want to know what's in the bag prior to putting it in your mouth. Yeah. I think the same thing applies to insurance. You want to know what it is that you're buying, regardless of what that cost is. Yeah. Cheap insurance does not mean best coverage. Cheap insurance does not mean you have good coverage. Cheap insurance does not mean that the coverage that you think you bought is going to be there in your time of loss. Yeah. So it pays. It, you need to pay attention as an insurance buyer of, hey, just because I've got cheap insurance and because in a soft market, I'm lulled to believe that I can get a flat renewal or less every single year, year over year, um, you need to understand that in today's marketplace, that simply is not the mantra that you want to operate yeah. with now. I, I know you work really hard to be a good steward of your customers, sort of helping them through being an informed buyer. That's the value you bring mm -hmm. to the table, to get them the best coverage at the best price so that they don't just make it a transaction that, okay, it's 3% this year or more, just sign the paper, let's move on. Mm -hmm. Because underneath that pricing, is coverage limits that they may not have 
expected to be sometimes significant, significantly different. Mm -hmm. And you help them identify that. I, that's what I like about your approach is that you make them an informed buyer and they end up being in a better position from a risk profile standpoint. Mm -hmm. So um, we were uh, meeting with a company recently, you and I, and um, you brought up a, a topic that I thought was interesting. Uh, and you explained it to the CEO that day at breakfast about how it works and the value. And, and you called it an assessment. Um, help our viewers understand what that is and why it might make sense for them to spend 30 minutes with you or someone like you. I mean, this is not a sales commercial for, for you as much as I admire what you do and how good you do it. I'm more interested in, in alerting the owners of those businesses watching us that they might want to think about something like this. How do, how's an assessment work from your perspective? Yeah, so how this really got started for us is uh, a colleague and I, uh, for the last 10 years, have been serving the timeshare uh, industry. And one of the things that we do for them, first of all, timeshare industry, just so you know, when insurance carriers develop policy forms, they did not have the timeshare industry in mind uh, when they were developing those forms. There are terms and conditions within the timeshare industry that are specific and unique to them, much like every industry that you business owner operate in. You have certain things if you're in construction that need to be endorsed within your program. If you are a manufacturer, there are other terms and conditions that need to be endorsed in your program. So where the assessment comes in and, and why we, uh, when we are looking at the timeshare class, why we went down this road is because their profitability and their sustainability is measured on maintenance fees. And there's policy forms, especially when it comes to business interruption, where that's simply not covered. So you have a resort that suffers a hurricane loss, like a lot of these resorts down in the Fort Myers area currently. Um, their business interruption, which pays for continued utilities, rents, uh, mortgage payments, lease payments. It can also pay for the cost of, uh, while the resort's down, to either keep key employees via payroll, et cetera. Um, those costs um, may not be covered under a traditional form. Typically, they only cover rental use um, and they cover revenues when the resort is down. But in the timeshare space, if you don't have maintenance fees uh, built into that policy, manuscripted in, or alter alternative lodging um, as, a, as a substitute for those individuals that have lost their week, if you're not looking at that policy language then um, and having that added to, then you lose all of that revenue, you lose everything that comes into that resort, and that's their lifeblood of sustainability. So I use that as an example because um, the same applies to you and your business. If there are unique things that need to be tied into there, the idea of the assessment is um, we're going to take a look at your business. It's not to say, hmm, what are you paying for insurance? I, I, I like to know that, but in the same breath too, that's not my goal. My goal is how are you protected? Are you protected to the most advantageous position that you can be in? And if you're not, that price point that you've been charged, is that really sustainable for you? Um, because at the end of the day, as I said earlier, if you have a loss and you weren't covered for it, the cost of insurance isn't the thing that's going to matter. It's going to be that additional cost of you having to dig into your own pocket to cover your loss. And so the idea of the assessment is, is let's uncover all of these things pre any sort of loss so we can maximize the coverage terms and conditions with the idea that either we can do it for the same price point. Because a lot of times, Bruce, it's, it's really, if I'm asking to have a policy endorsed, it may not cost you, the buyer, any more additional premium owed. Right. It's just knowing what to ask for, yeah. you know, and have it added to your policy. So... Informed buyer. Informed buyer, exactly. And I don't know, I, I'm a former attorney, um, went to law school, uh, was a former prosecutor out in Colorado. I don't know if it's one of those things to where at the end of the day, I'm just trying to protect my clients to the best of my ability. But my idea is, is let's truly understand what it is that we're paying for. I know you buyer, maybe you don't have time to focus on that. I do. That's why you hire me. I don't represent any insurance carrier. I represent you, the end buyer. Yeah. I look at it as, I'm an extension of your payroll. If you hire me and I'm not doing my job, I expect to be fired. <laughs> Much like if you hire an employee and they're not doing their job, they shouldn't be retained of services. Uh, 
make no bones about it. At the end of the day, my job is to protect my buyer's personal assets or company assets, whatever the role is that I'm hired to do. Yeah. Um, I got a couple questions, but the, a, a phrase comes or a quote comes to mind. I, I know you and I are fans of the Bourne movies. Sure. And there's a great line in one of them by the director of the agency trying to find Jason Bourne, uh, talking to his colleagues. We need to plan. We need to hope for the best, plan for the worst. Mm -hmm. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. And that's kind of how I feel just as an outsider looking at the landscape of the insurance world and companies trying to make sure they're, they're covering their risk because mm -hmm. they do have plans for growth. That's kind of what comes to mind. Um, and they need, they need an advocate to help them go through that process, be an informed buyer. Because mm -hmm. um, hoping for the best is great, but it doesn't always turn out that way. Right. Which leads me to mind. So, so anything else about this? Again, at breakfast that morning, what I what I was intrigued with, and I had not heard you talk about that before, um, the business owner asked the logical question, well, how much time does it take, Terry, and you know, what's it cost, and mm -hmm. who needs to be involved, and then what, what do I get? You know, what, what's the assessment actually going to show me? Mm -hmm. What's the end product? And you had you know, a very thoughtful process of how, how this works. Just share that quickly, if you will, with, with our audience. Yeah, so really, it's no skin from you guys. It's, it's simply it's flipping any sort of policy language uh, that you have, property, general liability, workers' comp, auto, those types of exposures, flipping that policy language to me. Essentially, me and my team, we go over, uh, dig into the policy language, go over and really are looking within, I mean, I guess the other way of saying it is the devil's in the details, right? And so yeah. we're looking for the details and trying to figure out, are you covered here? Or are you not covered here? Are you covered to the extent that you're covered. It essentially is a report that I develop, my team develops. We send it back to you and we point out where there are some holes in your program or where you can maximize opportunities, saying in another way. Um, certainly at the end of the day, I want to do business with you. Understanding that insurance is a relationship business. Um, I have to prove myself to you um, in the same breath too. I don't want you as a buyer of insurance uh, to be exposed if you don't have to be exposed. So right, right. Uh, really it's it, it's not a hard process. It's just a review of your policy language and then a report that we generate back to you at no cost. In a week or two? What's okay. the time frame? Within days. Days. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, I, yeah. I mean, that, that's awesome. You know, um, I just think that's incumbent upon companies to make sure that they're informed mm -hmm. and getting the best coverage they can. It's just too important in today's world. Which leads me to the next question, which is... Um, the hurricane Ian, mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously had a huge impact in Florida and all the homeowners there and the businesses there that you alluded to earlier. But how does it impact Joe Smith, who's got a hundred million dollar manufacturing company yeah. in central Indiana? Does it have an impact on him? Uh, not physically, but again, with, the, with regard to co coverage of his risk or covering his risk. Yeah, I think the fallacy is that we stand by ourselves. Um, I think for a long time, the story was always, well, you know, to your point, Joe down the street that has a manufacturing company, well, he didn't have any losses, and so therefore he doesn't have to share in the risk of anybody throughout the country. Well, that's theoretically kind of true, but at the end of the day, unless you are self-insuring your own property, that really is not how it works. Every insurance carrier groups into all the Joes that are of the certain manufacturing nature and groups them in together to price whatever the program is. Certainly they look at Joe's exposure as unique to Joe, but there's inflationary costs that are built in there, the cost of construction. Obviously with we are as a country, pandemic, post pandemic we're coming out, supply chains was down. Cost of construction was on the rise. Inflationary costs were going up. Keep the economy out of it. I mean we still had issues as it related to uh, the cost of goods and being able to service stock shelves, etc. So while those inflationary costs were, were building and going up, Ian's impact is going to be paramount to the Joes of the world. We may be physically in the state of Indiana, and yes, we didn't have a hurricane that hit us, but the cost, property cost, everybody's going to share in those. Yeah. Um, regardless of where you are in the country, uh, the cost of insurance, while the market was kind of trending out of a hard market, um, I was just told the other day that some property exposures, regardless of, or if you didn't have any losses, 
plan on your property exposure is going up 20% at renewal. If you did have losses, 50 and beyond. So, um, it, and then that didn't matter what part of the country you were in. So yeah. that's what I'm hearing in the marketplace as recent of two, three weeks post Ian. Yeah, that, that's really helpful, that kind of insight. Uh, anything else you were hearing in the market that a business owner watching us needs to think about with regard to their insurance? Absolutely. I think, you know, the fallacy of being in a soft market is that we're either going to have a flat renewal or we're going to have, we're going to pay for less insurance year over year. And I think it becomes really easy for you as a business owner to maybe disengage or not have your eyes on insurance, so to speak. It's easy in, in my terms, always give, you know, Johnny Heisman the role there um, as it relates to either loss control coming out on site or an underwriter wanting to get to know the risk better. Um, I think in a hard insurance market, if you want to maximize any sort of cost savings, knowing that there's potential for increase in costs in a hard market, you have to be involved. Um, if a loss control comes out, loss control individual comes out and to take a look at your property, be there. Um, you as a business owner, you can sell your story better than anybody else out there. You're passionate about it. And so for you to be able to tell your story to a loss control expert that's on site, to really glowingly be able to show your property, your operation, who you are and why you're better than everybody else, tells a story that no broker in the country is going to be able to tell better than you. And so to have that personal relationship with the loss control, the carrier that's coming out on site, or if your broker, what I try to do is I try to introduce the underwriter to the end buyer. The reason being is because if I can develop a personal relationship between the buyer and the underwriter who's pricing their insurance program, nine times out of 10, that underwriter is going to be more favorable from a pricing perspective to the actual buyer of insurance uh, versus if it's transactional solely where the underwriter's relationship with you, the buyer, is just a computer screen where they're just checking boxes to quote a program. So and especially at the time of loss, having that personal relationship helps expedite any sort of claim and keep it reduced from a cost perspective as that claim goes out. So there's things that you need to do, in my opinion, to help you overcome the hard insurance marketplace that we're in right now. Yeah, yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, anything else come to mind? Is that good? You got, that, that covers pretty much everything that, that a business owner need to be thinking about right yeah, now? Yeah, I think being in the marketplace early. I think that uh, the days of getting a quick quote um, at the last minute, you know, inside of 30 days, we're in a stress marketplace as it is. Hard market, Ian's going to make it even harder um, from a cost perspective. But, Bruce, you talked about it earlier, the pandemic. We lost a tremendous amount of people within the sales force insurance carriers just don't have the ammunition from a people perspective that yeah. they once had. And so they're stressed, they're inundated with new opportunities. Um, the quick turn that I think most business buyers could expect in a soft market, it's just not there. I ask my insurers and I expect my insurers to get in the marketplace 120 days in advance and allow the underwriter to actually dig in to who you are and what you do so that way when it comes time to pricing, and I try to get the price to them within a month in advance um, as best as I can. The only way you can do that is be in the marketplace early. If you're not in the marketplace early, you're never ever gonna have the terms and conditions delivered to you in t until the last minute. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm yeah. trying to avoid that altogether, uh, understanding that there's gonna be some circumstances and, and some risks that simply just come up on the deadline. So yeah. my advice is get in early, um, invite loss control out on site and be engaged in the process. Yeah. And ask your current broker advisor to be engaged in helping steward you through this process. Absolutely. You know, don't be just a transactional buyer. Correct. Is that fair? I think that's more than fair, yes. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, task your colleagues and other companies out there helping companies to do a good job. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I mean, Gregory and Appel, we have 160 employees. From the 60,000 foot view, we look like a generalist, meaning that you know, we insure manufacturers, we insure distributors, uh, contractors, timeshare resorts, uh, yeah. staffing firms, a, a whole slew of individual organizations, healthcare, uh, not-for-profits. And I think the thing is, is that when you actually get down to the individual producer level, we're a very niche-focused environment. If, if, In my opinion, if you're not getting what I think you're deserving of the premiums that you pay for your broker, um, 
they, sh they should be on your payroll. And if you're not getting that, if you're not seeing the return, call us. We're happy to help. Yeah, I know you are. Well, I appreciate your time and, and really appreciate you giving us some insights here. Um, back to that uh, hope for the best, plan for the worst. I mean, that's right. the world you play in every day for right. these business owners. And our objective with these videos has always been to help you build a sustainable, profitable, successful business. Um, recent study shows that 250,000 of you, including many here in Indiana, are going to be looking to sell your business in the next five years. Um, and you want to make sure you have a company that's valuable and protected so you have an opportunity to do that transaction. Mm -hmm. It's your one time to capitalize on all the hard work to grow a company. So what you do is part of that. And whether you use Terry or someone uh, that you're working with now, um, make sure that you're getting the kind of stewardship and advice that you need to protect your business because it is a different world right now. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. And thanks for listening. We hope this was uh, useful to you and beneficial back in your company for you and your CFO and call your insurance broker. Make sure you're getting a good deal. <laughs> thanks for the time. We'll be back with you again soon.